ion concentrations uh, have a little quirk on top of the regular concentrations that we talked about. So you dissolve something in a solution, you get a concentration of whatever that thing is by calculating the moles, dividing by liters, that gives you molarity. The reported concentration of an ionic solution, though, uh, reflects the concentration of the solute before it is dissolved in solution. So, um, okay, you guys have lab today. So in the lab today, we'll talk, and we talked a little bit today about electrolytes, um, but you'll be testing a bunch of electrolyte solutions by dipping electrodes from a light bulb into a solution. And there is circuitry in there so that you're not just getting like wall power straight into the beaker. That would be super, super dangerous. Um, it's not set up that way. Uh, so for a solution of one molar calcium chloride, uh, you're going to get one mole of calcium, Ca2 plus ions, but you're also going to get two moles of chloride per liter. And that's because when you add calcium chloride to a solution, CaCl2, it dissociates into the separate ions. So we get one calcium, and then we get two chlorides per every one calcium chloride that dissolves. So the easy thing here is that if there's more than one of a solution in the chemical formula, and it's an ionic compound, that's a key thing, if it's an ionic compound, then you multiply the concentration by the number of ions. So for calcium chloride, right, we started with 1.0 molar, and then for calcium, and you could also look at this as, it, it is using the mole ratio here. So one calcium chloride will give you one calcium two plus, so that's gonna stay one molar. And then here we have two chlorides. So for every one of these that we get, we're gonna get two chloride ions out. And so that's why the concentration there is 2.0 molar. So any electrolyte, any ionic compound that dissolves in water splits up into all of its ions. So this next example, very similar. If we have calcium, or it's actually almost exactly the same, right? If we have calcium and chloride, um, sorry, calculate the molar concentrations of calcium and chloride in a 0.75 molar calcium chloride solution. So if we start with the only number that we're given here, you might not even have to write out any formal math for this. So remember, for every calcium chloride, how many calcium ions are we going to get? One. One. So what's the concentration of the calcium? Ion? <coughs> was it? Well, it would be the same as what we started with. Well, we're starting with 0 0.75 molar. So it's that. The charge is 2 plus, yes. So we'll get 0 0.75 molar Ca2 plus. And then what would the concentration of the chloride be? Times 2, yeah, 1.50. So 1.50 molar. Cl minus. No, not not here. Yeah. Yeah. If you're writing out a balanced chemical equation, then you're going to need to say that this is two Cl minus. Yeah. For for this, you're just writing out the concentration that is in solution. Yeah. And then you can get that ratio here, right? Because we would write these ones in, right? That's one, one. <laughs> It'll be on the final. <laughs> okay, so that's ions. So for these ionic compounds, it's a special situation. Uh, for solutions, uh, the other thing, this is the other thing that's going to be on the exam, is solution dilution. So if you have a solution of one concentration, and you add more water to it, that's going to dilute it. And so now the amount of your solute, or the amount of thing dissolved, compared to the amount of solvent is going to be smaller. Um, 
And this is important, um, especially if you ever end up working in any kind of lab. The solutions are all stored as concentrated stocks because they take up way less space. So if you think about it, um, if you have a 10 molar, say we have 10 molar sodium chloride solution, that's going to take up, and we could have that stored in, let's say we have one liter. So we have one liter of that solution. To store the same amount of sodium chloride at one molar, so we had a one molar sodium chloride, we would have to have 10 liters of that less dilute or less concentrated solution. But from our 10 molar, one liter of 10 molar solution, we could make all of this. But we don't have to store it all in a lot of bottles. Yeah, when you buy a bottle of bleach, you have to dilute it, or there are a lot of things like that. Um, yeah, the other one, or uh, like, what is it, like soap for washing the floor, right, for mopping, usually comes as a concentrated solution. Um, the other one I can think of is degreasers. So you buy concentrated degreaser, add water, and it dilutes it. So these calculations do have a convenient formula. M1V1 equals M2V2. So here M1 and V1 are the molarity and volume of one solution. M2 and V2 are the molarity and volume of the other solution. So this equation works because the molarity multiplied by the volume gives you the number of moles of the solute. And then dividing by the volume of the other one will tell you the molarity, the new molarity, or dividing by molarity will give you the new volume. So actually, let me, yeah, so if we write this out, so M1V1, so I'm going to write this out as moles over liters times liters equals moles over liters times liters, right, either side of the equation. So without having any numbers in here, the liters will both cancel out, and moles will equal the same number of moles. Because when you're diluting something, you're not changing the actual amount of molecules or atoms that are in each of the solutions. It's the same number of those, but they're just spread out into more solution. So I'll be, we'll write out the units when we do some of those calculations also. And then this, this is the key thing, that this equation only applies to solution dilutions. It doesn't work for stoichiometry. And I will warn you ahead of time, the confusing thing will be that sometimes it will work but it'll only work when the mole ratio is one to one. So if the mole ratio is anything other than mole to one to one, then this won't work. And so I think that if you're, if you're doing stuff in homework, just try to remember that this is not for solution stoichiometry. And I know it's more confusing because you'll be like, well, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, I don't know what's going on. Um, that sort of like inconsistent information is always confusing. So only for dilutions. And then when diluting acids, this is more of a laboratory safety note, uh, you won't have to do this in lab. But if you do work as a lab tech or if you work in a lab at some point and you have to dilute an acid, you always add the concentrated acid to the water. So you put the water in the beaker first and then you add the acid because it generates a lot of heat. And if you add, if you put the acid in the beaker first and then you pour water into it, um, that little bit of water will hit the concentrated acid, generate a ton of heat, and usually immediately start boiling and splattering concentrated acid everywhere. Um, I have done that before. It's not a good time. No, it's <laughs> very, very, very bad time. But if you have the water in the solution or in the beaker first, you add, start adding that concentrated acid, it will generate heat, but now instead of heating up a little bit of water, to boiling point, it has to heat up the whole volume of the water first. And so it's able to absorb that extra heat. And the solution will still get hot, but it won't boil. Do you have an example of what you would have when someone could do that? Uh, 
you'd have to be working in some kind of lab because you'd have to have concentrated acid on hand. Uh, the only other thing that I could maybe think about is this also applies to concentrated bases. So if you're um, like canning or if you're, um, I don't remember what it's called for olives, but you use um, concentrated sodium or potassium hydroxide for that, lye. Um, you would want to, if you're going to dilute the lye, you would want to add the lye to water instead of water to the lye. <clears throat> That's probably the most, probably the only time you'd be working with that at home. Also, fun fact, Drano is also potassium hydroxide. Yeah. There's obviously one is food safe and the other is not, but it has other things in it usually. All right, so how do we do a solution, a solution dilution? So how much sodium, six molar sodium nitrate solution should you use to make 0 0.585 liters of a 1.2 molar sodium nitrate solution? So you gotta identify here, really gotta identify which numbers are going with which, right? Because we're gonna use this equation, M1V1 equals oops, M2, V2, and so molarity one has to go with volume one, and molarity two has to go with volume two. So we don't want to get those crossed. But we have to use context clues sort of from the equation, or from the question to get that. So we want to make 0 0.585 liters of a 1.2 molar solution. So those two numbers are linked there together. So this is going to be either our M1 or our M1V1, or it's going to be M2V2. It could be one or the other. Um, doesn't really matter. So I'm going to make it the I'm going to make it the M1V1 because that's kind of what we're starting with, and we're going to be um, trying to figure out how much of the concentrated solution we need to make that dilute solution. So this will be 1.2 molar times 0 0.585 liters equals 6.0 molar times V2. Remember, molarity equals moles over liters. So then I want to convert these, this is 1.2 moles divided by one liter times 0 0.585 liters equals 6.0 moles per one liter times V2. So then we can multiply these two numbers together first <clears throat> and that'll cancel out the liters. So 1.2 times 0 0.585 is going to be 0 0.702 moles equals 6.0 moles per one liter times V2. And then divide both sides by 6.0 moles per one liter. Uh, and of course I ran out of space. So let's shift that all over. I'm gonna move this up. So <clears throat> this is one of my favorite math tricks. So when you get a situation like this, it's kind of difficult to see how the units cancel out. So what you can do instead is, uh, Dividing by some number is the same as multiplying by the inverse of that number. So if I take this 6.0 moles over liters and I flip that so it's one liter over 6.0 uh, moles, that'll be the same thing when I multiply. So I'll show you what I mean. 0 0.702 moles times one liter over 6.0 moles. 
and then that equals v2. And that makes it really easy to see that, oh yeah, we're multiplying, or we're going to be dividing moles by moles, so those units will cancel out and leave us with units of liters. <clears throat> so take that and divide by 6, 7.02, or 0 0.702, divide by 6. This is 0 0.117 liters equals V2. So to answer this question, how, many, how much 6 molar nit sodium nitrate solution should you use? You should use 0 0.117 liters of the 6 molar solution. I'll write that out. Use 6.0 molar to make 0 0.585 of 1.2 molar. And at least for me, this, these were problems where, I guess it took a while for this to become sort of intuitive. So for now, trust the equation, trust the units. Um, and the more that you do it, the more intuitive it becomes. But dilutions are always a little bit tricky. Yeah. And that is, that is essentially what we did. I just wanted to go through all of the exact steps of the algebra and also show the trick so you can see the units canceling out really nicely. But it, yeah, ultimately it ends up being these two multiplied together and then divided by six. So it's not super complicated. I just showed a lot of work here. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, this should be 1.2, or 0 0.0.12 0 would have the correct sig figs. Yeah. You should only have two. Cool? <clears throat> so, two problems. From this chapter that you'll get, you'll have to calculate the molarity made from some amount of a solid um, diluted into some amount of water. And this will also be on there. And then take a solution of a known concentration and dilute it to something else or figure out how much you need to make another solution. It could be any combination, right? I could take either find M1, find V1, find M2, or find V2. Right? It could be any of those. That'll kind of depend on how the question's worded. But usually you can figure that out based on what you're given, right? We were given two molarities here, so that means we have to find one of the volumes. It's just which one. All right, so making a solution. Yeah, so we're gonna make a, a solution. If it's not a acid, concentrated acid, so for example here we have a 12 molar stock solution of potassium chloride, which is not an acid. We can pour that into the beaker first and then add water to it to get up to our desired amount. Otherwise, you want to add some water first, add the acid, then dilute. Then dilute further, I should say. OK, solution stoichiometry. So in reactions involving aqueous reactants and products, uh, it's often convenient to specify the amount of reactants or products in terms of the volume and concentration. So we say we have this much of something of this concentration, because then it makes it easy to calculate the moles, and it's also easy to measure out. So we can use the volume and concentration to calculate the number of moles of reactants or products, and then use the stoichiometric co coefficients to convert to other quantities in the reaction. So that's where you get the so just for, well actually it's on this next one. So the general solution map, 
it's going to be this. And notice that in the center here, moles of A, moles of B. Right, so this is that extra branch added onto um, the other stoichiometry types that we have. Right, because we could do grams end with grams. We do uh, PV equals NRT, gases to other gases. Or we can do now solutions to other solutions. Um, I do want to write out that whole thing. So the whole thing here will be grams. I like to start out with the grams of A because that's what we started with. That was the first one we learned. All right, so that's grams to grams stoichiometry. But we can also do this where we use PV uh, equals NRT. And we'd have to have the pressure, the volume, and the temp and the temperature of A. And on the other side, we can convert using PV equals NRT to get the pressure, volume, or temperature of B. And now we've added this stoichiometry, or solution stoichiometry, where you use molarity. And if we have the volume of something and the molarity, Then we can also calculate the volume of B using molarity. And so the way that I recommend you use this is looking at your problem initially. What units are you starting with? What units are you given? And then say, OK, do I start here? Do I start here? Do I start here? Oh, and I guess we write these in too, right? This is the molar mass, is what we used to convert there. And then this would be the mole ratio from the stoichiometry, or from the uh, uh, balanced chemical equation. So, right, if you start with a volume of something and you're given a molarity, and it says it reacts with something to form something else, find the volume of the something else. <clears throat> then you can use volume times the molarity to get moles of A then use the mole ratio to get moles of B, and then calculate the volume of B, or the molarity of B. Or you could calculate grams, or if you have other things, you can calculate pressure, volume, temperature. So all of these ultimately end up just being different ways that we can calculate the number of moles of something. Because we have to calculate the number of moles, because that's the actual numbers of things that are reacting uh, in a chemical reaction. <clears throat> okay, so put it into practice. How many milliliters of 0 0.112 molar sodium carbonate will completely react with 27.2 milliliters of 0 0.135 molar uh, nitric acid according to the reaction? So we're given balanced chemical reaction can check that. Um, let's go back. We can conveniently have these on both slides. What are we starting with here? How, or I guess, what, which of these units that we're given in here can we use to calculate the number of moles of something? Molarity? Molarity of what? We're given two molarities. All right, so we've got molarity of sodium carbonate and molarity of nitric acid. But what else do we need with molarity to calculate the number of moles? Liters. liters. So if we have molarity and liters of something, then we can calculate the number of moles. So what do we have molarity and liters of? I guess milliliters of, in this case. Nitric acid. So we have 27.2 milliliters of 0.135 molar nitric acid. So we'll be starting with the volume and molarity of nitric acid. So our A is going to be nitric acid. Um, so we'll need to convert the 27.2 milliliters. This is going to be, I'll write it out, 27.2 milliliters. How many milliliters are there in a liter? 
1,000. So there's 1,000 milliliters. One liter. Oops, not that. And so it's going to give us 0 0.0272 liters. So starting with our 0.0272 liters of HNO3. Our first step will be, and actually let me write this out. So we got, um, we're gonna start with the volume, volume of HNO3. And then the first thing that we wanna calculate is the moles of HNO3. So how many, how do we calculate how many moles of HNO3 that we have? So if we have moles, or we have liters, sorry, <clears throat> and the molarity is moles over liters, it might also help to write some of these things out as moles over liters, right? So 0 0.135 one three five molar would be 0 0.135 moles over liters. So if I plug that in here, moles HNO3, one liter, so the liters of HNO3 will cancel out, and then we'll get moles so that calculates our moles of HNO3. And now, what are we trying to calculate from this? So we know where we're starting, where are we ending on this? Start here, moles of here. What is moles of B? What is our B in this problem? Well, that's 27.2 moles of A, the nitric acid. <clears throat> We're gonna use the mole ratio, yeah. yeah. But we've got a lot of things in this chemical equation. Mm -hmm. So what is the mole ratio? Which one are we looking for, I guess is what I'm sodium trying to ask. Carbonate. Yeah, the sodium carbonate. And that's also the other thing that's given in the question. So if we wanna find the moles of sodium carbonate, we know we've got nitric acid here, sodium carbonate's there. So what's the mole ratio between nitric acid, HNO3, and carbonate, sodium carbonate? Yeah, one over two. So two moles of HNO3 for one mole of Na2CO3. <clears throat> and then that'll cancel out the moles of HNO3. So moles of HNO3, two moles of Na2CO3. And then the last well, not quite the last step, because we want to know how many milliliters of sodium carbonate that we're going to need. So if 0 0.112 moles of Na2CO3 over one liter, right, we can use the molarity to convert between moles and liters, but we'll have to flip this, invert it, 0 0.112 moles of Na2CO3, one liter. And then we do want milliliters, so we'll convert this back into milliliters. So 1,000 milliliters is one liter. And so moles of Na2CO3 cancels, that'll give us liters, and then liters cancels to give us milliliters. So then we just multiply everything across the top. 0 0.0272 times 0.135 times 1,000. That's everything on top. Divided by 2 and divided by 0 0.112. So the answer here is that we'd have to react with 16.4 milliliters of 0 0.112 molar Na2CO3. 
That's how much would completely react. Just more stoichiometry. Any questions? No? Okay. <clears throat> so for this next one, we have a 25 milliliter sample of nitric acid uh, requires 35.7 milliliters of 0 0.18 molar, 108 molar uh, sodium carbonate to completely react with all of the nitric acid in the solution. What is the concentration of the nitric acid solution? <clears throat> so slightly, slightly different problem. This is using the same, actually I can do this. Oh, that got big. So same balanced equation. <clears throat> and we are still looking at nitric acid and sodium carbonate, but from a different perspective here. So the question kind of always is, how can we calculate moles of something? And whatever we can calculate moles of, then we can start with that. So what species? Do we have enough information for? Yeah. Why sodium carbonate? We have a volume and molarity. Mm -hmm. We have volume and molarity because molarity equals moles over liters. <clears throat> and again, we'll have to convert these into, oops convert these into liters. So 35.7 milliliters times one liter over a thousand, it's gonna be 0 0.0357 liters. So 0 0.0357 liters. And the first step is to calculate moles let me write any CO3. So to calculate the moles from an amount of liters, we have to use the molarity. So this is going to be 0 0.108 moles over one liter. So that'll give us the moles of sodium carbonate. And what is the question asking us to find? Moles of nitric acid. All right, so we've, starting, with, starting with carbonate here because we have liters, milliliters, and molarity. But we want to know how much nitric acid, what concentration the nitric acid is that it's reacting with. <clears throat> so we're going to look at the mole ratio again between sodium carbonate and nitric acid. Last time we started with nitric acid, this time we're starting with carbonate. So what's the mole ratio that I'm going to plug in here to go from carbonate to nitric acid? Two moles nitric acid over one mole, Na2CO3. And so that'll give us the moles of nitric acid. And this is where, again, having molarity equals moles over liters is really helpful because that'll give us the moles of nitric acid. And we know the liters of, um, we know the liters of, my, of nitric acid. So we can stop here sort of and calculate the moles first. So 0 0.0357 times 0 0.108 times two. And it's going to be a small number, so it's 
one, two times 10 to the negative three moles. And then if we convert our, convert this volume again into liters, we'll just do 7.7112 times 10 to the negative three moles of nitric acid divided by 0 0.0250 liters of that solution. So if I divide by 0.025, this will be 0 0.308 molar HNO3. Any questions on that one? Correct. And we don't want it to. Because we're trying to match, so these are the units, moles divided by liters of molarity. So, yeah, sorry, capital M is the molarity. Did make a jump there. Capital M. Okay. We'll move on then. <clears throat> the last uh, couple things we're going to learn how to calculate. Actually, answer, answer a question that was asked earlier. Um, so the first one is freezing point depression. The other one we'll talk about is boiling point elevation. And these are called colligative properties. Um, colligative properties only depend on the number of dissolved solute particles and not the type of solute particles. So it doesn't, de doesn't matter what you dissolve into water, it will reduce the freezing point and it will elevate the boiling point. So adding a non-volatile non solute to a liquid extends the temperature range over which the liquid remains liquid. So you can heat it up to higher temperatures before it starts to boil. So those are freezing point depression and boiling point elevation. Uh, adding salt to ice lowers the melting point. So if you, well, if you've done the experiment or the, I guess it's kind of an experiment, where you make ice cream at home, you take a bag and you add a bunch of ice to it, and then you add a bunch of salt to it also. The salt lo lowers the freezing point of the ice water. So while the ice is trying to melt, if you remember, uh, ice melting is endothermic, so it's absorbing heat from its surroundings. The ice is pure water, can absorb a lot of extra heat from the salt water before it starts to freeze. And so you can get water that's much colder than um, zero degrees C. And that's how you're able to make ice cream that way. Also use it to keep roads from freezing. So if you've never lived anywhere other than here, you've probably never seen that done. <laughs> Um, but like in the Midwest, East Coast, places at higher elevation, they'll salt the roads. So they go out with trucks and they spread salt onto the roads and then that keeps them from freezing. Um, the other one that gets used a lot is, or the other common substance is ethylene glycol or propylene glycol uh, is antifreeze. So you add that in a mixture. Oh, there's another example of a dilution that usually comes as a concentrate and you have to dilute it and then put it into your car's radiator. And around here, it's mostly to elevate the boiling point so you're not turning that uh, coolant for your engine into a gas. In other places though, if it gets cold enough, you don't want the water to freeze in your engine because as water freezes, it expands and it will crack your engine or can crack your engine block uh, and destroy the engine. So, So the way we calculate this is using a different unit that I'm not particularly fond of because it's hard to say, uh, and that's molality. And I will continue to say it like that to try and differentiate it from molarity because molality and molarity sound way too similar, especially if you've never heard those words before. So molality 
is specifically for calculating how much solute is being added to a solvent because it only matters how much, or sorry, for colligative properties, it only matters how much solute is present. So molality is the moles of the solute divided by the kilograms of the solvent. So remember, solution is everything. Solvent would just be the water. So if you have one kilogram of water, how much ethylene glycol, how much salt is in it in moles? So moles solute per kilograms of solvent, not solution. So calculating the molality is very similar to calculating molarity. We just need to know that molality is moles of solute divided by kilograms of solvent, not solution. So if we have uh, 50.4 grams of sucrose and 0.332 kilograms of water, uh, let's see, so 50, well, sucrose, we're gonna have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, right? We need the moles of the solute. So we need the molar mass of sucrose. Uh, so there's 12 of those, 22 of those, 11 of these, times 12.01, times 1.01, times 16. Um, plus 11 times 16. So that's going to be 342.34 grams per mole sucrose. And so 50.4 times that will give us, oops, not that, equals No, I did that wrong. I should have divided. Sorry, so 50.4 divided by the molar mass, 342.34. There we go. Is uh, 0 0.147 to two moles divided by 0 0.332 kilograms H2O. So this is 0 0.443, no, 443, sorry. 0 0.443 molal sucrose. Find the moles, divide by the kilograms of the solvent. <clears throat> and of course, <laughs> just to add to the, all the confusion of molality, the abbreviation is a lowercase m, which is the same as mass. So I'm not going to use it. <laughs> yeah? No. Nope. This is not on the test. Uh, it will be on well, it could be on the final, depending on how much space. <laughs> uh, I think these calculations are actually fairly easy compared to everything else. Finding molality is moles per kilograms of solvent. That's pretty good. That's pretty easy. Freezing point depression is also an easy calculation. Um, the only thing you need to know, and this is why molality exists, because these colligative properties are very easy to calculate if you have molality. Um, so the delta, so delta means the change in the freezing point temperature, delta TF, is molality times the freezing point depression constant. So you just take molality, multiply it by the constant, which I would give to you, and that will tell you how many degrees the freezing point will be depressed. It does not tell you what the freezing point is, and I'll show you what I mean. It's a. Uh, 
No, k, k is just commonly used for constants. Yeah. OK, so we want to know the freezing point of an aqueous 2.6 molal. I hate molality. <laughs> molal sucrose solution. Then delta T f equals uh, 2.6 moles of solute over kilogram of solvent times the freezing point depression constant, which is 1.86. This is degree C, degree C times kilograms of solvent divided by moles of solute. So right, all of those units cancel out to leave you with degree C. So 2.6 times 1.86. The change in the freezing point is going to be 4.836 degrees Celsius. And then this is the tricky part, right? Because that's higher than zero degrees C. But what this is telling us is that our freezing point will be 4.836 degrees C lower than the normal freezing point. So the normal freezing point of water is zero. So we're going to say zero degrees C is the normal minus 4.836 degrees C so that our new freezing point of this solution should be negative 4.836 degrees C. So the freezing point is this. Oh, yep. Yeah, so this zero is the normal uh, freezing point. So for freezing point depression, it'll be the normal freezing point minus. So just remember freezing point depression. It's depressed, so it goes lower. So it'll be that many degrees below. And then boiling point elevation is the same thing in the opposite direction. So boiling point elevation is also a colligative property. So if we add some non-volatile solute, could be anything. The only thing that matters is the number of moles of that thing. Um, so antifreeze, for example, will prevent, over, or prevent boiling of the engine coolant at hot temperatures. So the equation is almost identical. The temperature change in the boiling point is the molality of the solution times the boiling point elevation constant. And the boiling point elevation constant has the exact same units as the freezing point depression constant. And the same sort of caveat applies where we need to, after we calculate what the change is, we need to calculate what the new boiling point is going to be. So change in the boiling point is going to be 3.5 molal times 0. 512. So the change in the boiling point is going to be 1.792 degrees C. And that means that we still have to calculate our new boiling point. So what's the normal boiling point for water? What temperature in Celsius? It's 100. So we'll take Mm -hmm. 100 degrees C plus 1.792 degrees C. And so our new boiling point is going to be 101.792. So this is actually, yeah, it's, yeah. 
we also kind of lose all of the information because it would just be 1.0 times 10 to the two, and it's like, well, did it change or not? So yeah, I'll give you more sig figs than just two. 101 point, we'll just say eight um, degree C, the new boiling point. Usually use regular rules for sig figs, but not enough were given here. Although actually I think this, this does work out to be the correct number of sig figs because we're adding this. So this had two sig figs, so these two are significant. So when we add them together, we keep those two. And then we keep the, sm no, we keep the smallest number of decimal places. So this should be 102. Again, I will give you more sig figs. But just remember that you have to add that on for boiling point elevation, freezing point depression. And you could also think of, to help remember that it's freezing point depression, you know, seasonal affective disorder. Uh, people get more depressed in the winter. All right, last concept here, and this one is just a concept, is the concept of osmosis. So water and liquids tend to try and flow to equalize concentrations. So they don't like it when there's, I mean, of course we always personify things in chemistry, but like you say the water doesn't like it when there's on one side of a barrier a high concentration, on the other side of the barrier a low concentration. So the water will move from the high concentration to the low concentration, or to the, sorry, from the low concentration to the high to dilute things, to equalize things. So when solutions containing high concentration of solute draw solvent from solutions containing a lower concentration. So this is why you can't drink seawater. Well, there's a lot of reasons you shouldn't drink seawater, but one of them, and the main one, is if you're ever stranded, if shipwrecked, God forbid, but the seawater will actually dehydrate you because the salt concentration is so high, it will suck water out of your intestines and further dehydrate you rather than hydrating you at all. So it'll draw all of that water out of your tissues. <clears throat> uh, in an, osmotic, an osmosis cell, we kind of create an artificial barrier um, and put a high concentration solution on one side and a low concentration solution on the other. And then you can use this to measure osmotic pressure. So when you first set this up, the water levels on both sides will be equal. But if you leave it for long enough, and this is like a salt impermeable barrier, so water can go through, but other things can't, the water will move over to the higher concentration and it will raise the level of that water by an amount that depends on the concentration difference. So the more different, the more differenter the concentrations are, the more that water level will rise. Uh, osmotic pressure, like freezing point depression and boiling point elevation is a colligative property, so it only depends on the concentrations, the amount of the solute uh, in those solutions. More solute, more osmotic pressure. Uh, I like this last one, this last slide, because I think these images are cool. So if you're like super dehydrated or overhydrated, um, you can end up with your blood cells looking different because of the surrounding fluid concentrations. So uh, let's see, I remember these. Hypotonic, meaning that the surrounding is lower. So in a hypotonic solution, the surrounding fluid is lower in solute concentration. Yeah, so red blood, or the water flows out of the cell. It makes your red blood cells look all spiky. And then in a hypertonic solution, no, 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 I got that backwards. So isotonic is normal. Hypotonic means that the surrounding concentration is lower, so the water flows into the cells. This is hypotonic. In a hypertonic, then the concentration outside the cell is higher, and water flows out of the cells. Which changes the structure of the cell. All right, 